this t-shirt is a great sign that he's innocent because he doesn't even have to say all this stuff he's got a he doesn't even have to describe sebastian he's showing up to an interview that he knows is going to be on the side of the road there's not going to be any news graphics behind him showing sebastian so he is showing sebastian what does sebastian rogers biological father seth rogers know about his son's disappearance if anything I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. In today's video, we'll analyze an interview Seth Rogers did with Fox News. If you're not familiar with this case, here's a quick summary. On February 25th, 2024, Sebastian was reported missing by his mother and his stepfather, Katie and Chris Proudfoot. Sebastian is still missing, and many suspect the Proudfoots no more than they're admitting to because he was with them at the time of his disappearance. I personally have not analyzed the Proudfoots, and that's because I've seen them do many YouTube interviews to clear their names. And I would like to invite them to do an interview with me before I analyze them. So Chris and Katie, if you're watching, you can contact me at deceptiondeck.com and we can arrange it. It doesn't even have to be a video interview. It could even be an AMA in my forum, whatever you're comfortable with. The point is, if I don't detect any deception in our interview, I, for one, will vouch for your story. With all that said, let's start listening. Today, Seth, it's been more than a month since your son went missing. How are you feeling today? Same as I was yesterday. Um, just, just a quick warning. I think this interview was recorded in mono, so you might need both headphones in order to hear it. Continuing the search, continue looking, I'm not going to give up. Nobody can make me give up. And where have you been searching? Where do you think he is? I've been searching everywhere. I mean, anything out of that, that five mile radius that the initial search did, they covered everything there. But there's stuff elsewhere. I mean, we got a lot of territory to cover. And it being over a month, he could be anywhere currently. So I'm searching everywhere. You, Katie, and Chris had a meeting with TBI. So the interviewer asked him, where are you searching? He told us a five mile, mile radius, but since it's been a month everywhere, this is actually a very good answer. So if you followed my channel for some time, you know that my audience, whenever I do a community poll, typically votes for me to analyze parents of missing children. I think is it strikes a chord with the true crime community. There's really nothing sadder than a little kid who's missing, especially if the parents are responsible. So for example, we've analyzed William Tyrrell, Madeline McCann, Summer Wells, um, and most recently, Madeline Soto, who went missing on the same day as Sebastian Rogers. When parents of missing children get the opportunity to go onto the news or to do a YouTube interview or go on Nancy Grace like the Proudfoots did. You can expect them to do certain things. So typically, this is my checklist you can find in the DB forum. They do these things. They speak about the kid in the present tense and that's because they don't know whether the kid's dead or not so they default to alive. It's easier that way. If you don't know what happened to your kid, you're going to want to believe they're alive especially if it's only been a month. Number two is they are cooperative. So when the interviewer asks them a question, they do their best to answer it. So even if they don't know where the kid is, they will give their best guess. And we saw Seth Rogers do that right here. She asked where he's looking. He said, ideally, it's a five mile radius, but because it's been a month, I'm searching everywhere. I don't know where he is which is different than just saying, I have no idea, or I don't know, like we saw Casey Anthony say, and recently we saw Jennifer Soto say that, and um, uh, Madeline Soto's stepfather, Stephen Stearns. So even though the answer was vague, it was cooperative. Third is parents of missing children are inconclusive. In other words, they don't know what happened, so even if they have a best guess about what happened, they can't say for sure. Which is why when the McCanns said from day one, Madeline must have been kidnapped, or the Wells said, 
Summer Wells must have been kidnapped. Without any evidence of a kidnapping, it's a red flag for a hoax. Fourth, parents of missing children typically will look into the camera and address any kidnappers. So they might say, hey, if you have my kid, please drop them off at a police station. There's a reward. We won't pursue you. Um, they have medical needs. He needs his medicine. Anything they need to say to a potential kidnapper because it's on the table of possibilities. Fifth, they address the child through the camera. So if you have this one opportunity to speak to the news and you don't know where your kid is, you're likely to take that opportunity to talk to them through the camera. When parents don't do that, it can indicate that they know where the kid is and that they know they're dead because speaking to, the ca to them through the camera doesn't even occur to them. Right? We always speak based on everything we know. So the parent who knows their kid is dead or knows where their kid is might not take that opportunity because it doesn't even occur to them because they don't have that curiosity in the first place. Sixth, we can expect the parent of a missing child to ask for help. Right? They know that they're not doing this interview to clear their names or build up their alibi or build a story. Typically, they don't even need to be prompted to ask for help. That's the entire reason they're appearing on the interview is to ask for help. When they don't ask for help, it's a red flag because it might mean they have some other agenda, like they want to clear their name or they want to build up a certain narrative of a kidnapping, right? So they're pushing a story um, or they want to make people feel sympathy for them. Either way, they have some other agenda besides asking for help, which should be the only priority they have. And then number seven, there's a call to action. So, for example, they say, hey, if you see my kid, here's what they look like. Call them by this name, right? He responds to Sebastian or Seb. Uh, and we have this special hotline number or call 911. Whatever it is, they have some sort of call to action. Just like a commercial always has a call to action, right? Commercials know what their purpose is. Call 1-800-whatever to claim your coupons. The point is they have a call to action because there's a purpose. When there is no call to action, once again, it's a red flag the same way that not asking for help is a red flag, that the parents are appearing on the interview for some ulterior motive, and that requires digging into further. So he gave a great answer to that first question, and we can see that he has a picture of Sebastian on his t-shirt, as well as Sebastian's age, 15 years old, weight, height, last time he was seen. This right here is meeting lots of the criteria already, and we're only a few seconds into the interview. So he's being cooperative, and he's asking for help through his t-shirt. He's providing useful information, as well as a call to action, right? If you see this kid, call 911. Hi, today, did you find out any new information? Not that I can discuss. Any progression that might show hope in this search? Oh, I always have hope. Can't take that away from me. And how come? This is another good answer. So I'm going to bring up another one of my checklists just briefly to show you why hope is so important. You can find all these checklists for yourself. I've put them all in the resources tab on forum.deceptiondeck.com. So here's my 911 call checklist. And basically, this is just a checklist that the FBI created to determine if a caller is innocent or guilty. It might have been updated in the past few years, but this is the one I prefer to use tailored to what I like to look for. And as you can see, that parents who are calling 911 who are actually innocent never give up hope. They deny the victim's death, whereas guilty callers often accept the victim's death. So they start saying, well, she's dead or he's dead. Or they speak about the kid in the past tense. So the fact that he's not giving up hope, even after a month, is a great sign that he doesn't know whether or not Sebastian is dead. Guilty parents, even if they're trying to act like they're innocent, still slip up and speak about the kid in the past tense because they know the kid is dead. 
And the famous case of that is uh, uh, Susan Smith. But we also saw Don Wells do it. We've seen the McCann slip up and do it. We've seen William Tyrrell's foster parents slip up and do it. How confident are you that Sebastian is alive? And in fact, most recently in my last video, How to Expose a Psychopath, we saw Stefan Stearns do it. He gave an interview less than 24 hours after his stepdaughter went missing. And in that interview, he said, well, it's hard to find hope or we've lost hope. That's not what you would expect the parent of a missing child to say, especially less than 24 hours after they went missing. But it is what you would expect someone who knows the kid is dead to say. Because, yeah, they've lost hope because the kid's dead. Is alive, and what do you think he's doing right now? Uh, pretty sure he's probably playing video games somewhere. Nobody's letting him, you know, whoever's got him, they're not letting him see the regular news. They're not letting him surf the internet. Or else he'd know that I'm looking for him. And he'd know that he should actually be trying to get a hold of me. And that keeps me going. Is there a strong reason to believe he may have been abducted? I don't know if he's been abducted or if he's just, you know, over at a friend's house. Once again, this is the right answer. He's not conclusive. He's inconclusive. He might have been kidnapped. He might be at a friend's house. He's a 15-year-old kid. Maybe he ran away. Maybe he's staying in the woods. The point is, the dad doesn't know because he literally doesn't know. Whereas parents who know what happened reveal it through the words they choose. Or they reveal it through the hoax they try to push where they, they only consider one option. And the favorite option of guilty parents is a kidnapping because it points all the attention away from themselves. So whenever you see a parent of a missing kid insist that the kid was kidnapped without any evidence, a red flag should go up that this might be a hoax. Because actual parents of missing children might consider a kidnapping as one of the options, maybe even a big option, but it's not the only option. They're genu genuinely curious about what happened to their kid because they don't know what happened. So the kid could have run off, could have been kidnapped, could be hiding, could be up in the attic, you know, pretending to have run away. Never know. But I'll know when I find him. I'll know exactly what has happened to him. And other news outlets were reporting that there were lights seen in the backyard that were caught on camera by a neighbor's video. Is that true? No. What that was was a trash truck went through, picked up trash, and when it left, of course it went faster. It didn't have to stop to pick up trash. That's just false information provided by a particular person. Did the dogs ever pick up a scent for Sebastian? For my information that I've been given, no. So notice how he tries to answer every question. So he's cooperative. As far as I know, no. Based on what the police have told me, no. Is it possible the dogs might pick up a scent? Yes. So the inconclusiveness is the sign of someone who actually doesn't know what happened. Whereas, for example... There's so many comparisons of guilty parents, but once again, I'll just point to Stefan Stearns because we did this video most recently. When he was talking about evidence that the police found, he said, well, they found videos, but none of it's useful. Right? Or it was too grainy. By saying the evidence isn't useful that early on, it shows that he has knowledge outside the facts. He knows more than he should. How does he know the evidence the police have is, is useless. How could he be so sure? Why not hold out hope that it is useful? Right, so for example, here, if Seth had said, well, the dogs, the dogs aren't going to find anything, that would be a red flag. How would he know the dogs wouldn't find Sebastian's scent? So these subtle words that people use reveal what they know and it's very difficult for liars to manipulate their answers to sound honest because you always speak based on everything you know so for example if i know i've been speeding and a cop pulls me over and they say do you know what you did wrong i will answer differently if i wasn't speeding 
just based on whether or not I know I was speeding, even if I want to lie or tell the truth. The words I pick will be different because I know certain things. For example, I might try to be more persuasive that I wasn't speeding if I decide to lie. Did they find anything on Sebastian's cell phone that would, you know, kind of show that he was going to run away or where he might be? Not that I know of. He didn't have any internet access or anything on there. He had been able to call, text, take a picture, send a picture, use the calculator. That's about it. Uh, was Sebastian in school on Friday the day before he went missing? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, are you, Chris or Katie, or any of you suspects in this case? No, we're not. Also, just one note, if you're new to my channel, because every time I start a new series, I get lots of new subscribers. So thank you for hitting the subscribe button. Um, thank you for joining the channel. But one thing about my channel is I do not analyze body language. I think that it's more distracting than it is useful. And that's why the behavior of Pale and I disagree on so many cases, including the McCanns and the Wells. So, for example, where he just had his hands up over his head, a body language person might say, you know, that's self-soothing or, or he's trying to look bigger than he is. I don't know what they would say, because in my opinion, it's voodoo. And if there is any redeeming quality about it, it's outweighed by how much it distracts you from the words, which are actually the most important things to pay attention to. So just know that I saw him doing that with his hands. Um, I'm sure I'll get comments about people pointing it out. Personally, I don't factor it in at all into my analysis. And I'll just quickly give you one last opinion about body language that I have. So lots of times I'll get people in the comments saying, well, DD, why don't you at least factor in body language or um, at least consider facial expression or tone of voice when you're doing your analysis, right? Because the more data you have, the better your analysis, right? Um, and I wrote about this in the forum, and I'll just put it out here just so everyone has my response to that. So does having more data always lead to better understanding? It depends on how you see things. For instance, deception analysts such as the behavior panel analyze everything from speech to tone of voice to body language, and they seem to believe that more data about the subject equals a more accurate analysis. So on a graph, for example, with amount of data on the x-axis and accuracy of analysis on the y-axis, it would look something like this if they are correct, right? So they would be this yellow dot here with more data, more accurate, and I would be down here, the blue dot, right? Because I, I deliberately exclude data like tone of voice and facial analysis and body language because I think it can be misleading. So I would be down here, right? They would be more accurate than me. However, I see it differently. Adding data does not always improve understanding. So there's an ideal amount of data. There's a perfect amount of data that would provide the best insight, right? Some hypothetical, mythical, perfect amount of data you can get from someone to be the most accurate you can when you're analyzing them. So too little data and you're just guessing too much data and you become too exposed to bias or distraction or misdirection, especially when you're analyzing a psychopath. Because as you saw in my Stephen Stearns analysis or Nicole Kessinger, um, or even the Wells, I do believe they are psychopaths, they can mislead you with the, the way they act. So if you start factoring in their trying and their tone of voice, you can actually be misdirected by adding that data in. So my viewpoint doesn't necessarily follow a straight line. It's more of a curve. So if we were to chart it out with the same axis, neither the behavior panel who would be this yellow dot or I would be perfect. Right? So if the perfect analysis is right here at the peak of the graph, behavior panel would suffer from having too much data, too much stuff that could mislead them. And I might suffer from having a little bit too little data. Uh, so I wouldn't be at the peak either, right? Nobody's perfect. So to minimize bias and distraction, I deliberately avoid learning too much about my subjects beyond their words. And this approach might lead me to overlook some key details of the cases, but on balance, I believe it results in a more accurate analysis. While on the other hand, the behavior panel's extensive use of data and research 
ensures that they do not overlook any significant details, but it also exposes them to the risks of distraction and being misled, especially by skilled deceivers. So finding the right balance of data is key. It's not about having more, it's about having the right amount. So all that said, I don't analyze body language on my channel because I think it's not worth it. Uh, have you been cleared? I don't know. The investigation is still ongoing. We wouldn't be cleared until the investigation is done. But current There's another good answer. Have you been cleared? I don't know. I'm personally not cleared. I don't think anyone's been cleared. We see this all the time with hoaxers, with parents who are pretending their kid was kidnapped. Because they know what happened to their kid, they're not curious about other suspects. And they reveal themselves by not suspecting everybody. So, for example, in the case of the McCants, they said that before their daughter was allegedly kidnapped from the, their resort in Portugal, one of their friends checked the bedroom. And then when they went back, their daughter was missing. But they never suspected that friend of doing something with their daughter. The fact that they had no suspicion for the friend is a giant red flag that they know what happened to their daughter. Same with Stefan uh, Stearns and Jennifer Soto. Stefan is, was just Jennifer's uh, daughter's, uh, not even stepdad, right? Jennifer was dating Stefan. He allegedly drove her daughter, Madeline Soto, to school, and then Madeline Soto was never seen again. Yet Jennifer never suspects Stefan of doing anything, right? They've been together uh, close, never accusing each other, not even a question. So the fact that they do not question each other is a sign that they both know what happened. Whereas actual innocent people, just like Seth Rogers here, they can't rule anyone out until the investigation is over because they don't know what happened. So like it or not, if your kid goes missing, everyone is a suspect. Same for the Wells. Don was allegedly at work when his daughter Summer went missing. The only people at the house were his wife, Candace Wells, and his mother-in-law, Candace's mother. Yet he never accused them or questioned them or considered that maybe they did something to her and were too scared to tell him. The lack of curiosity is the sign of a hoax. Currently, from my understanding, they don't have any information that would attach us to any wrongdoing. Um, CPS has gone to Katie's house before. You didn't know about that until this investigation. How does that make you feel? That somebody somewhere dropped the ball because I was never informed. And I'm the biological father. I have joint legal, joint physical custody. Somebody dropped the ball and didn't reach out and inform the, the father, which is me. And I don't understand why the state dropped the ball on that one. And how... Another thing you'll notice here is that uh, Stephen, oh, so, what is his name? Seth. Seth Rogers doesn't try to ingratiate himself with the authorities. Right? So he says, so much, CPS dropped the ball. They didn't inform me. And that's typical of innocent people, right? His kid is missing. The police have not found his kid for a month. CPS visited the house and he was never informed. He is rightfully pissed off at them. And we actually see this in 911 calls of innocent parents. So counterintuitively, innocent people, when they call 911 or when they're dealing with the police, are actually urgent and rude because they don't need the police to necessarily like them. Right? They're impatient with the police for not finding their kid. Whereas guilty callers and guilty parents are often very polite and very patient with the police. And that's because they're not actually stressed. The longer the police take and the more they fumble, the better. And because they know they're guilty, they feel the need to make the police like them because they know that if, someone's, if someone likes them, they're less likely to accuse them of the crime, to look into them. So it's a manipulation tactic. And it's a manipulation tactic that reveals that someone has guilty knowledge. So I do like to see this, where he's not letting CPS off the hook for not informing him. 
he's rightfully angry. Right? He's indignant, which is a sign of someone who's actually innocent. How did you find out about CPS? Podcast. And I mean, how does that, does that concern you, especially with this case that they might have done something to cause him to run away? I don't know what that really means, but I just know that I don't have all the information. Um, is there an official timeline? And I know people, you know, there was, you know, we went to bed at this hour, but does TBI or anyone have an official timeline as to the series? I'm pretty of sure they do, but. I'm not involved in the investigation, so I wouldn't have it. Have the three of you been in contact every day like you were several weeks ago about this? I was in contact with both Katie and Chris today, but I've heard he said his phone is open and available. Well, so is mine. You um, can leave a voicemail. Like seven or eight people have already left me voicemails today. I'm just, I'm going. You know, I get people calling me while I'm on the phone, and it's like, I can't just sit there and answer the phone for everybody. If I did that, I probably wouldn't be able to get out of my house. There's been a lot of criticism over this investigation. I'm sure you've received criticism as well as the Proudfoots. How does that make you feel in a time where you're just trying to find your son? All right, so one other thing that guilty parents do is they spend a lot of attention looking at what's said about them on social media because they're scared of people figuring them out. So let's see what he answers here. Typically, an innocent parent wants to clear their name and find their kid, and they're not too concerned about people criticizing them online. And as usual, I've not watched this interview before. People are being, well, that those that goes back to those keyboard warriors I talked about on the first interview that you and I had. They're still at it. They'll never stop. There's cowards in this world. And then there's people who are go-getters. My beat, my feet, they're on the ground. They're never going to leave the ground. I'm going to find my son. Period. And plans, you know, today on moving forward. All right, so it sounds like early on, maybe when they did that first interview, I didn't realize he'd done another interview with this lady, that he was paying attention to it. He's over it. Now he's looking for his son, which is correct. Forward, anything, any more resources being used on this investigation or anything you have to say about that? The United Cajun Navy is currently sitting down there right now at 90 Volunteer Drive in Hendersonville. 1030. That's when volunteers need to show up, 1030. Show up, have your ID, sign the paperwork, and they send people out in teams. When you show up, there ain't nobody there except for a couple people. That's because they've already sent teams out. They're just going to keep sending teams out until we find my son. Have there been um, a lot of volunteers coming out to help find Sebastian? Today there was, and I want to thank everybody who did come out. We are seeing an increase, and we're going to continue to see an increase. I'd like the whole state of Tennessee to volunteer, and then we'll hit other states. And you're Sebastian's father. Tell me, what is Sebastian like? All right, so here's another opportunity for us to predict what an innocent person might say and a guilty person might say. Typically, guilty parents find some way to blame the kid for what happened to them. And this is how they rationalize what they did to the kid. Right? So they have to convince themselves that the kid was bad or that they deserved it. And we saw this with Ruby Frankie recently. Right? I came back to YouTube because I saw a Ruby Frankie video. I saw that she was doing these sadistic things to her kid, but they were subtle and she was posting them on YouTube and, and uh, people weren't recognizing the signs. Right, so she was punishing the kids, humiliating them, but it's always the kids' fault because she had put them into an ordeal that no matter what they do, they would do something wrong, and then that justified her punishing them. And as we saw in her recent journals, she convinced herself that the devil was inside them, which allowed her to punish the kids. Right, so she enjoys, she's a sadist, she enjoys 
punishing her kids, but she needed justification to do it. Here, for example, I think Jennifer Soto revealed that she had dehumanized her daughter, Madeline Soto. When she was interviewed about Madeline, she said, well, Madeline left her phone at home, so she couldn't call us if she was kidnapped. And she has ADD, and she has a bad memory. In other words, she found lots of ways to blame Madeline for what happened to her, which to me was a giant red flag that she had dehumanized Madeline for a long time, right? Long before that, over years. And of course, it's now coming out that Jennifer's boyfriend, Stefan Stearns, sexually abused Madeline for years and probably ended up killing her. So let's see here if Seth will tell us what a great boy Sebastian is and give us details about him that will help us find him, or if he will subtly victim blame and blame Sebastian for what happened to him. He's a unique child, all right? He can be, he can, I mean, there's, it's really hard to describe my son. I mean, besides being unique, whether he's up to no good or he's up to good, he's still, he's just got that uniqueness about him. It's, it's, it's really hard to describe. I mean, he's my mini me. If he, if he has a goal, he's going to accomplish that goal. You know, people at school. They liked him. All the kids are wanting to know when he's going to come back. They want to help and volunteer. Teachers are wanting, they're putting out prayers every day. You know, everybody, it's coming up. It's Easter. I'm hoping for an Easter miracle. You know, I could definitely use it in my life right now. And why did they search the land? All right, so that response was off to a rocky start. But in the end, it was all praising Sebastian and basically praising him through the outpouring of teachers and fellow students who are now looking for him. So he must have been a good kid. And I think this video will actually premiere on Easter. So, as you know, every video I premiere, I am in the live chat during the premiere chatting. So if we are premiering on Easter right now and I'm in the live chat, um, happy Easter to everyone who celebrates. And hopefully Seth does get his Easter miracle. The landfill. I have no idea. They didn't, not part of the investigation. They're not going to tell me stuff. I am emotionally attached as any parent should be. And how often do you meet with TBI? If I, I call them all the time. Call, text, hey, any new news? Once more, this is a good response. He's pestering them. Now, he knows he's pestering them. I call them all the time. I text them. But that is what innocent parents do. They don't sit back patiently and um, be polite and let the police handle their work and give them all the time they need. They're rushing the police, right? Find my kid. Why have you not found my kid? And a great example of this is Gannon Stouch's biological mother, who I analyzed. Um, in my video, what do innocent parents look like? So if you've not watched that video, I recommend watching that one where I show two examples of innocent parents. And one of them was Gannon Stouch's biological mother. Right? And if you know that story, Gannon was actually murdered by his stepmother. They either let me know or they let me know. Are you, are you happy with the work that all these agencies have done, or do you think there needs to be more? There could probably always be more. Once again, another good answer, right? No ingratiation. It's not like Summer Wells' parents, right, Don and Candace Wells, where they say, well, the police are doing a great job, and you know, thank you to the police when they hadn't found their kid. So this is what I would expect an innocent parent to say. I appreciate their help. I appreciate them looking, but more could be done. Because until your kid is found, it's never enough. We just got to figure out what more is necessary. Am I happy with them? I'm not unhappy. 
But you ask me that after after my son's back, and it's going to be, I'm happy. <laughs> That's textbook. So I know uh, lots of my subscribers clip my videos, and I actually have a place for your clips here so that they get featured. Uh, like this one from Katerina Rostova. So if you guys do have a YouTube channel and want to clip that, uh, please do clip it. That is the perfect response from an innocent parent when they're asked, what do you think of the police looking for your kid? It's been a month. I appreciate their help. They haven't found my kid yet. And if you want to see an even more aggressive response, look at uh, my video, what do innocent parents look like? And look at how Gannon Stouch's biological mother deals with the police. <laughs> All right. Because in, in law enforcement, it's always goal-oriented, you know? Go to go to work, put a smile on your face, get the job done. I know that they're putting their effort, 150% effort into this. And I appreciate that. And I'm hoping it will pay off with fruitation. Do you think Katie and Chris are suspects? I have no idea. All right, here. Do you think they're suspects? The answer is everyone is a suspect. So this is the beauty of the checklists. And like I said, you can find all of them at forum.deceptiondeck.com because my checklists are proactive, right? I don't, I have, I've had these for a long time. I can apply them to any case. They're not checklists that we make after the fact because when people make a checklist after the fact, it's useless, right? I can, it's like predicting a stock. Tell me if it's going to go up or go or it's going to go down. Don't tell me after the crash that it was going to go down. And that's how I think of body language a lot of the time. If you know someone's innocent or guilty, well, then it's easy to say, yeah, you know, guilty people put their hand on their head. You can interpret it however you want. I go strictly based on words, and I'm hoping that the Proudfoots recognize that, watch all my videos, and agree to do an interview. I feel like of anyone, I will give you the fairest shake. Other thing to note about my channel is I don't research the cases beforehand. I go strictly based on the words. No idea. Sebastian's been missing for more than a month now. What keeps you getting up every morning, going out and searching for him? Being a dad. Having perseverance. Wanting him to come home. Well, I was wanting to watch him finish growing up. Do you wear this every day? Talk to me about this shirt. This right here is my own billboard to find my son. People know. Yeah, this t-shirt is a great sign that he's innocent. Because he doesn't even have to say all this stuff. He's got a, he doesn't even have to describe Sebastian. He's showing up to an interview that he knows is going to be on the side of the road. There's not going to be any news graphics behind him showing Sebastian. So he is showing Sebastian. People notice people. People notice what people are wearing. So I am a walking handout. I have these in my car. Have you, how do you select that photo? It's so cute. Because it's cute. <laughs> it's got a smile. It's the last picture I took of him. All right, so final thoughts. I don't think Seth has any guilty knowledge about what happened to his son. And the fact is that he met every single criteria on our missing child presser interview checklist. On your screen right now is my analysis of Jennifer Soto, the mother of Madeline Soto, the little girl who went missing the same day Sebastian did. And personally, I think she's guilty. So if you want to see someone who failed my innocent parent checklist, I, re I recommend watching that to compare and contrast. Also on your screen is my Sebastian Rogers playlist, so make sure to check that out and subscribe so you can know if and when I add any more videos to this series. And of course, if my interview with the Proudfoots ever happens, I will put it there. So Proudfoots, please do consider my offer. You can reach me, like I said, at deceptiondeck.com. Until next time, stay true.